I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. He's written for the Atlantic. He wrote articles such as why Obama was a failed president for black America. Uh, uh, reparation. Uh, well, what we get wrong about wealth and class in the United States. And of course, I have Dr. Jared Ball on the line for my mix what I like. Uh, he's a, <laughs> introduce yourself, Dr. Ball. Please, you're one of my heroes. You got to. Well, I don't know about all that. I don't know if I deserve all of that, but <laughs> the, I mean, it's just a quick introduction. My, again, my name is Jared Ball. I'm a research professor of communication studies at Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, and I have been um, an activist, a grassroots organizer, uh, in addition to uh, a journalist, a media maker, and a quote unquote traditional academic for I don't know, around 20, 25 years. Uh, and I run a multimedia website to that effect called imixwhatilike.org. Uh, and we invite people there where they can pick up on uh, any number of uh, conversations and multimedia and written work on uh, all manners of black history, African history, uh, so-called radical politics and more. And I just lastly, I mix what I like is, is both in practice and in name an homage to I Write What I Like, which was the journalism practiced uh, under the pseudonym of Frank Talk by the great Azanian true hero, Steve Biko, uh, the South African revolutionary of black consciousness who was assassinated in 1977. So the I is not meant to be I as an individual, it's meant to be uh, you know, a reference to Biko and the we in the broad speaking uh, African liberation struggle. So thank you, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dr. Ball. Um, one other thing that Dr. Ball has taught me as I've seen his research is that there's always a unification between various cultures and uh, continents, right? People don't know that Fidel Castro helped for the liberation of apartheid through South America. Correct me if I'm wrong any time, by the way. Um, che Guerrera also participated in the liberation of South America. Uh, Africa and various African countries in order to stop the exploitation of people of color throughout the United, throughout the world by the United States and major corporations. There's always been a historical connection between people of working class, low income, and of course considered secondary uh, people by the WASP society, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Mm -hmm. So in a way, this is also uh, a way to kind of connect. Again, hence the reason why I always want to shout out Mr. Uh, Hector because Hector didn't have to do this, but he took the time to put this together as an Andorian descendant, right? And he said there is a connection, historically and otherwise. So I want us to understand that we are all working together for a better world in the United States. And we're having a big right-wing push, you know, from the Trump to even the Democratic Party, in my humble opinion, Ooh. which is extremely right-wing. We're not, we're not getting any type of progressive or any type of movement for working class people at this point, in my humble opinion. So at this point, I'm merely waiting on the line for Dr. William Darity. Um, again, he's the Duke University economist who's been studying this as well for about 20 years. His perspective is a little bit further, a little bit more to the right. It's a little bit more conservative. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be interesting to see how this discussion uh, evolves and takes place. I'm not above conflict. Sometimes we need conflict for resolution. We've been taught that conflict is always a bad thing. Conflict is necessary to get compromised and better outcomes, right? Steel sharpens steel. Dr. Ball is definitely on his P&Cs and Qs, as is William Darity. So it'll be interesting to see these different perspectives even sharpen one another and challenge one another and challenge our own ideologies as to what reparations truly means and what it could be going forward and how to impact our society writ large, okay? So at this point, please bear with me while we're getting uh, in touch with Dr. Uh, Derrick, and then we'll go from there. Okay, Dr. Ball, in the interest of time, would it be possible for you to give us a little bit of historical analysis as to um, why reparations are, are necessary, if it's not too much to ask, sir? Well, sure. Um, now, uh, just for the record, uh, initially, and I even went back through my notes, I, I, was, I was expecting to be discussing buying power specifically, um, uh, though this is not a problem. I just want to be clear that, that I do not consider myself, uh, though it's been mischaracterized this way recently, I'm not a reparations activist. I am not 
uh, uh, part of the leading uh, efforts uh, led by uh, many over the you know centuries, really, uh, depending on how you define it. Uh, and it's never been a core feature of the work I've been involved in uh, for a number of different reasons that if we have time, we can get back into. But, but, it, uh, uh, but what I will say is that it's not because we, I and that those I work with don't think reparations are important. It's just that there, there is a, a, a political, I guess, um, uh, you know, there's an analysis about how about, it, about a preference for assuming political power rather than seeking redress from a state that is uh, actively seeking to oppress. Um, but essentially, reparations uh, has been a long, uh, uh, movement with various uh, um, iterations. It's international and has been taken up by uh, various uh, descendants, not only of, I mean, we're, we're speaking in an African context. I mean, other communities have sought reparations, but essentially reparations just means uh, uh, sort of an, anything from uh, an, uh, an official state apology to financial remuneration uh, or any other, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, um, uh, seeks uh, uh, efforts to redress uh, prior oppression in the, in the case of African people around the world, uh, enslavement, and in various areas around the world, in various locations throughout the diaspora, there have been a, a multitude of tactics uh, uh, engaged where, depending on the setting and depending on the specifics, uh, which are important, uh, as, as different people sought to, to find ways to be paid back for enslavement and colonialism uh, and, and the like. In the United States, uh, African people, so-called Black Americans or African Americans or Africans in America, uh, formerly Negro, color, and many other, um, uh, with, a re with, with, by the way, a state-sponsored um, cultural industry redefinition of nigger. And this popular use of nigger among Black people in the United States uh, has a history behind it that most young people are not even aware of by design. Uh, where it has been encouraged as a form of use, uh, specifically as a tactic to move black people away from understanding their connection to the African diaspora. And it's very much connected to the history of black people being told at one point, if you want to retain African in your name of your organizations and your work, then you must be forcibly returned via the American Colonization Society to the continent. So uh, that's a slight digression, forgive me, but, but, uh, uh, but the point being, and, I, and, and I'll try to wrap it up here very quickly, is just that uh, here in the United States, uh, African descendants uh, of enslavement have been fighting for uh, forms of reparations for a long time. Uh, uh, the, some of whom that I'm most familiar with, of course, in the more recent uh, uh, history are in COBRA, uh, the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. Uh, but there have been many other forms and very other, various other iterations. And one of the reasons why I like what Encobra does, and this is something I think we could come back and talk about later on as part of their reparations package, is not only uh, do they help develop the current H.R. 40 bill, which is uh, just an extension of the, the, the Conyers, uh, Congressman Conyers, uh, formerly Congressman Conyers bill to study uh, whether or not black people should get reparations. Um, but they specifically have as part of their uh, platform uh, uh, an immediate release of our political prisoners. And that's something that is extremely important to me because we still have political prisoners in the United States, uh, formerly of the, or still part of the black liberation struggle and other rel uh, related struggles who are still being punished uh, for their, uh, you know, um, unwavering commitment to all of our freedom. So I like that as part of the platform. Uh, and where I will stop is that where I, where I end up disagreeing with all of my comrades on this issue is that uh, I think tactically, not that I'm arguing, and again, we can come back to it, not that I'm arguing that black people don't deserve reparations, quite the opposite. And I think black people in the United States deserve reparations, uh, if not more than anyone in, in human history, certainly as much as anyone who has ever deserved them. Um, but tactically, in a country where such a decision would require uh, uh, something akin to a constitutional amendment, where electoral politics would be heavily involved, and two-thirds of the country would have to be involved, and white America would have to be involved, in, in shifting and redistributing uh, millions, if not billions of dollars to black people, I think tactically the, the, the movement should be uh, uh, something more general and all-encompassing, uh, something more akin to 
what some have described not a democratic form, but an actual socialist revolution, something that, it, that fully institutionalized and redistributes the $23 trillion of GDP that we all contribute to making in this country uh, that satisfies everyone. Because the idea that white people and others are going to vote for black people specifically and only to get reparations, which we certainly deserve, I think is tactically flawed. But that, that there, I, I think I'll stop there, let others chime in and uh, let the conversation uh, uh, go from there. Thank you, Dr. Ball. Uh, first and foremost, I want to welcome Dr. Darity. Uh, are you able to hear me, doctor? Yes, I am. Fantastic. Thank you, sir, for joining us, and thank you for being a part of this discussion. Uh, the question that I propose to... No, no, it's our pleasure. Uh, the question that I propose to Dr. Ball, uh, I'm going to repeat to you, if you don't mind answering, is... What are the historical implications for reparations for black folks in the United States? Um, I'm going to give you the floor at this point. Feel free to answer, sir. So uh, I think that the starting point uh, for thinking about the historical trajectory of reparations has to be the failure to provide the formerly enslaved folks with the 40 acres and a mule that they were promised. And in fact, there was a, a smaller number of, of formerly enslaved people who did actually receive 40 acres of land uh, based upon uh, General Sherman's special order number 15. Uh, but Andrew Johnson reversed that and abrogated all subsequent efforts to try to, uh, to meet the claim for an initial stake in American society on the part of the formerly enslaved. So, uh, so for more than 150 years, I think a claim for reparations has been made. The claim has evolved because the initial, the initial basis for, uh, for the claim was, was the, uh, uh, was the horrors of slavery, uh, the atrocity of slavery. Uh, but subsequent to the period of enslavement, of course, uh, we had nearly a century long period of, uh, of, of legal segregation in the United States that we call the Jim Crow period. And that's an additional damage or harm that requires compensation. And then the third, the third phase of this is in the post-civil rights movement or the post-civil rights legislation era, in which uh, we still have uh, a, a horrendous array of, uh, of, of, of atrocities that are being visited upon, upon black folks in the United States, ranging from uh, the... Um, uh, the police executions of, uh, of unarmed blacks, uh, to the issue that, uh, that, uh, Dr. Ball just raised of the, uh, the mass incarceration phenomenon and the imprisoning of, uh, of blacks for primarily political reasons, as well as, and this is most important from my perspective, being an economist, uh, the enormous racial wealth gap that persists to the point that if we were to look at the average black and white household at the mean, the average black household would have $800,000 less than the average white household. Uh, so, uh, so, so it, it's not just slavery that is the relevant harm to be, uh, to be addressed by a compensatory program or a program of restitution, but it's uh, also uh, a wave of, of damages that are associated with the post-slavery period. Uh, and I would say that in addition to the initial claim for 40 acres and a mule, uh, the activist Callie House pursued uh, uh, an effort to try to provide uh, pension funds for the formerly enslaved folks toward the end of the 19th century. Uh, she was unsuccessful. She was charged with mail fraud uh, in the same way in, in, in which uh, Marcus Garvey was subsequently charged with mail fraud, and, and her efforts were, uh, were, were systematically closed down. Uh, 
organizations like Encobra have carried the fight on subsequently. Uh, I think that Encobra bears a strong relationship to the efforts of Queen, uh, Queen Mother Audley Moore, who was one of the primary reparations activists in the, in the mid 20th century. Uh, and then I, I think that uh, we had kind of a burst of attention to the prospects for having reparations that took place towards the end of the 1990s and the beginnings of the the, the, the current century. Uh, but I think that that conversation was extinguished in large measure because of the attention that was drawn to the 911 attacks. Uh, I think that there was a lot of uh, a lot of energy growing around the reparations effort at that point, but, uh, but it, was, it was eliminated with 911. And we haven't really restored the conversation for reparations in a significant way until uh, Tennessee Coates puts out the article in the Atlantic in 2014. And then uh, there's been, I, I, I'm, I'm not really capable of explaining precisely why, but we now have a rel relatively remarkable moment where there are uh, serious political candidates who are actually talking about reparations. Uh, they are talking about reparations in a way in which I don't think anyone has really considered it in the public square since the Reconstruction period. So uh, that's kind of my review of, of the uh, of the sweep of what I view as the history of the reparations movement for uh, black American descendants of people who were enslaved. Thank you, Dr. Darity. Uh, for relevancy's sake, would you mind explaining uh, the, the economic equivalency of 40 acres and a mule in today's terms, financially, please? So if I were to calculate the value of 40 acres and a mule today using a 6% interest rate, uh, from 1865, and the 6% interest rate would encompass uh, not only what type of modest rate of return individuals might have received on any investment they made at that point, but also the effects of inflation, then uh, today uh, the value of 40 acres in a mule would be about $2.5 trillion dollars or approximately seventy to eighty thousand dollars per eligible Black American. Thank you, Dr. Darity. That's that's a lot of money. Um, uh, yeah, and and that's actually a baseline estimate. I mean, the total bill, from my perspective, would be considerably larger than that. Wow. Thank you. Um, I want to follow up with a question because I know both of you have done some great research on the myth of uh, the myth of black buying power, some of the economic myths of black spending, to kind of uh, clarify why we shouldn't be so downcast on our economic circumstances as, as African Americans. Um, again, I'm gonna reiterate, I'm a nurse practitioner, and I actually cited both of your work um, during the holiday season because I had a patient that was suicidal uh, because he said he didn't have enough money. Uh, he was African American gentleman, he was in his 40s, going on 50s. Um, he had become despondent, alcoholic, and tried to commit suicide twice. And as long as I don't disclose his name and location, it's okay. But it, it has definitely had a, a widespread impact, some of the myths that have been perpetuated about economic disparities amongst black folks. Would, um, I'm gonna actually ask Dr. Darity to lead off if it's okay with you, Dr. Dr. Ball. Um, would you mind explaining a few of the myths about, about um, black economics that you have uh, uncovered covered in your research, please. Yeah, so I've been particularly concerned about the perspective that says that black Americans have a, uh, have a, uh, a, a, an awful position economically because of our own behavior, our own actions, our own dysfunction. And so the work that I've done has been, uh, has been an attempt to try to correct that narrative and to argue that there are structural and historical factors that lead us to be in the position that we are in. And that we also have to be very realistic about what that position looks like. And so, uh, so that, that was the motivation for developing this report that's called uh, What We Get Wrong About Closing the Racial Wealth Gap. And among the kinds of 
uh, of myths that uh, we attempted to address in that report are a set of beliefs that are associated with the notion that if black folks just behave differently, we could close the racial wealth gap. And the argument that we make in the report is, well, no, not with our existing set of resources, which are so limited. Um, and so one example or one illustration from the report is the claim that uh, if black folks actually had more two-parent families, then the racial wealth gap would be eliminated. So again, that's kind of a behavioral change that's, that's arguing that uh, black folks have to increase the stability of their families. Well, you know, I'm all in favor of having more stable families, but insofar as that's something that people are claiming would close the racial wealth gap, that's not accurate. Uh, white single parent uh, families have more than two times the net worth of black two parent families. Uh, another example is the uh, the claim that if black people were more motivated about getting uh, more education, uh, which is kind of a strange claim since I think black Americans are one of the most motivated communities in terms of focusing on educational attainment. But nevertheless, people will say, well, if black folks got more education, then we might close the racial wealth gap. And what we point out in the report is that blacks with a college degree Black heads of households with a college degree have two thirds of the net worth of, uh, of 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 white households where the heads never finished high school, and, and then there's an entire section of the report that intersects with Dr. Ball's work, where we look at this notion that if black folks would only spend their resources on black businesses and black banks, then we could uh, we could build this mighty black corporate empire and eliminate the racial wealth gap. And, and I, I think I'll stop there because perhaps uh, Dr. Ball can talk more about those, those, those myths. Thank you. So the floor is yours, Dr. Ball. Please explain the myth of black buying power. Sure. Well, <clears throat> what, I've, what I've come to you know, find about this, and I, I, my, my particular look at this issue uh, began over about 10 years ago primarily um, not as an academic, but more as an activist, because for years sitting in particularly grassroots activist settings, where you're sitting among, you know, very poor people committed to some sort of level of political struggle, somebody would invariably get up, whether as a presenter or during just conversation and make a point that we've all heard, I think in some variation, um, you know, it, many times, which is something to the effect that if we just spent our money better, so, similar to what Dr. Darity was just saying, somehow that if we per behaved differently, and in this regard, just spent our money differently, uh, and, and more specifically, would stop buying things like hair, uh, you know, Chris Rock's film did a lot of, I think, damage on this concept, but uh, if we stop buying hair or rims or, or weed or, or tennis shoes, that somehow we could marshal that money into something that would uh, uh, close that racial wealth gap or, or develop businesses and, and, or circulate the dollar in the black community longer, which is another part of that. Um, and, and this, is a, this is a myth, as I've argued, that has been buttressed not only by a, a massive propaganda campaign that I'll come back to just in a moment, but by um, a lot of well-meaning black political pundits and activists themselves and over a long period of time. So one of the issues that I've run into quite understandably is that when I come into the room, even with all the data, just as Jared Ball, and then I say things like, Everybody from Malcolm X to Dr. King to Amos Wilson to Claude Anderson to Louis Farrakhan to uh, certainly the more contemporary, and I don't even mean to you know, include them in these with that list of people, but people like Boyce Watkins to uh, uh, so many others. And I say that they're all wrong. I mean, understandably, even when I bring the data, people, you know, <laughs> say, who is this cat? Like, <laughs> who does he think he is? Talking about Malcolm is wrong. In fact, the only political luminary that I've found that has been right on this issue, by the way, is, is someone who is, is among my favorite, if not the favorite for me, is George Jackson, who quite rightly in a one-line statement 
said something to the effect that every time we're told our purchasing power goes up, the state just increases inflation and puts the value of the dollar we're spending right back where it was in the first place. So it really doesn't, it more or less balances out and we don't end up, anyway. But I say all that to say that buying power is a marketing phrase developed by, uh, and, you know, the, sh the short version is, it's a marketing phrase developed by those who are looking to assess to, uh, 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 the ways in which commercial enterprises, businesses, companies could better market what they're selling to various different communities. And in this case, it's black people. There's a buying power uh, associated or uh, labeled or imposed on any segment of the population you can think of, whether it's millennials, whether it's, it's even subsets of that, you know, in terms of race and gender, whether it's, uh, um, you know, Generation X or Y, or whether they do it generationally, whether they do it by municipality, uh, uh, whether they do it by different so-called racial groups, but only when it comes to black people has it been weaponized through myth and propaganda. And I think the mistakes of our, of our uh, you know, of, 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 in some of, within our activist efforts, uh, and it becomes specifically and, and, and more harmful and more pernicious um, and used to justify the inequality that exists. So in other words, people will say, many black people unfortunately as well, if black people spent money better, uh, or you'll hear something to the effect, the GDP of black America would, 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 would make them the equivalent uh, of a top 20 country in the world. More uh, with a GDP, a gross domestic product larger than Mexico as it was pointed out in the last uh, uh, study of this. Um, one GDP is not a, 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 does not is not a, an indicator of uh, equality in a community. GDP does not measure inequality. That is, it similarly makes the mistake of saying that if black people are a nation and spend as much as any other nation, it, it ignores what I would argue is the colonial relationship these nations have to more powerful dominant empires or nation or or, or um, uh, mother country, so to speak, like the United States. So in other words, the, the, the relationship doesn't change and the money that you're spending isn't able to enrich or close racial inequality or, or gap racial or, or, or wealth inequality, but it's just money that is able to be spent on acceptable and available purchases. So one last thing to try to make it even more simple in this, in this initial statement is that buying power measures the money that, uh, in this case, black people can spend on what are available goods and services. It is not an indicator of economic strength. It is not an indicator of wealth. And it is not an indicator of um, uh, uh, options, so to speak. So in other words, just and I'll, and I'll stop here for now, I could get a $30,000 loan specifically and only to buy a car. I cannot get a $30,000 loan specifically and only to buy land or stock. I would not qualify for an equivalent loan uh, for, 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 for each something more uh, potentially asset building like a home uh, um, uh, or certainly the kinds of stock investment that, that is, is you know, involved in developing wealth for the most wealthy in the world. So what ends up happening is people are, are, are sold a myth that if you just spend differently, uh, we would be able to close these gaps and we would be better off. And that's just entirely false because spending is not how you uh, increase wealth or increase uh, um, economic strength, uh, saving and investment and developing of assets. So finally, one of the, the issues that I end up having in all of this is that my conclusion uh, becomes uh, politically untenable uh, for many to really take up the debate. And that is simply put that my argument is really a subset of the classic uh, uh, that was found in George Jackson's cell when he was assassinated, by the way, by Earl O'Fari Hutchinson, the myth of black capitalism, which was a more, I think, uh, powerful and, and substantive look at the overall economic and social order here that basically says in a capitalist economy, there is no racial or there is no equality, period, that can be attained. Even if you just look within white America, white people can't uh, uh, close gaps and become equal in a capitalist society. So certainly, the, the, the black population that is whose exploitation is, is so essential to driving the inequality uh, certainly cannot you know, uh, achieve parity in any kind of way in a capitalist economy and certainly uh, not through spending and, and, and consumption when, as Marx was still correct, the, the, the owners of the means of production are the ones that own the wealth and the power, not the people that do the shopping. And I hope that resonated somehow. 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Darity, may I ask you a question concerning uh, a piece that you wrote in The Atlantic approximately two years ago concerning Obama uh, not being as effective as he could have been for the black community. Um, you offered some legitimate critique, and I would like to hear some of that insight if it's not too much to ask, sir. Um, do you believe yeah, that he did enough economically, rather, for the black community here in the United States or even abroad? Uh, well, I, I think he didn't do enough for black America substantively, although uh, I will say he never promised to do much of anything. It's not a failure of intent. It's a it's a failure of practice. Okay, so um, so 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 I have a a, a, a few complaints, and they're pretty compact. Uh, the first one is I was very very disturbed about Obama's mobilization, or as Dr. Ball puts it, weaponizing of this idea that blacks are responsible for their own. Uh, condition of economic inequality uh, because of their own behavior. So I think Obama very much bought into the dysfunctionality image of black of, of black Americans. Uh, I think that that's perhaps maybe the most tragic aspect of, of 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 his presidency, where there was an opportunity to craft a very different narrative about the black experience in the United States. And it was not something that he was interested in doing. Uh, the second thing that, that really, really bothers me about the Obama presidency is the fact that he uh, was systematically opposed largely to any programs that would have been specifically directed at black Americans. Uh, the only exception, I think, or the only significant exception was towards the end of his presidency where he introduces my brother's keeper. Uh, which I find to be problematic, but also consistent with this uh, argument that black people's behavior is the cause of black people's problems, or to put it in a slightly different way, what's wrong with black people is black people. Uh, and so, you know, this, this is a perspective that I completely reject. And, uh, and, and so that's, that's the second reason I was very concerned about Obama's presidency vis-a-vis -vis black Americans. And then the third reason is related to that, which is in the context of his opposition to race specific policies to benefit black Americans, he also was opposed to reparations. And so we have the paradoxical situation of the first known black president of the United States actually being opposed to black reparations. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm going to propose the same question to you, Dr. Ball. Uh, please give your insight. Uh, this is specific to Obama, still correct? That's, yes, sir. Yeah. Well, one, I think what Dr. Darity said is exactly right. I think, and I, and, and I got kind of excited at his initial point that that you know, Obama never promised anything, and, and this was one of the biggest things. And and one of the things that, as someone. Uh, um, who admittedly, who was running briefly for the Green Party nomination in 2008, uh, uh, and saw this one who studied the, the media and the, the, uh, the, the campaign in particular, uh, that was brilliantly developed uh, as a strategy by the Obama campaign. In fact, one of their tactics uh, overtly discussed at one point was to put Obama literally everywhere, just in, in image, quick sound bite, give, having him give speeches all over the country, all, in fact, all over the world as often as possible uh, in the run up to the election, specifically as a tactic to keep people from being able to keep up with what he was saying at any given moment. So that many people, black people in particular, went to the polls uh, assuming things about him that were factually incorrect and things that, as Dr. Darity rightly points out, he never said. But they were just assumptions. And in fact, not that I'm a, a fan of the show or, or using TV for, for educational purposes at all, but the one thing I think that the Boondocks version, television version, got right, uh, the comic strip was far better, uh, was season three, episode one where they made entire, you know, uh, comedy about how people were coming to conclusions about what Obama had, was or was not going to do that were based entirely in misunderstanding uh, and just, you know, an adherence to certain image. And by the way, I was also uh, particularly disturbed at the, the way the campaign um, 
uh, manipulated Barack Obama's blackness uh, to make him not only seem more connected to the black American struggle, uh, 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 but specifically to make him seem like he was, uh, a, you know, an adherent to that struggle. In other words, making allusions to Dr. King and allusions, not, not even specific references, just sort of alluding to Langston Hughes and alluding, and at one point, Eleanor Clift, when she was still with the McLaughlin group, uh, basically told white America, uh, he's safe to vote for because, quote, he, he's black but does not have the baggage of slavery, end quote. Saying, in other words, his blackness should not be reminiscent for folks in white America of Nat Turner or Malcolm X or something like that, but something a little more ambiguous uh, and, uh, and therefore safe. And I think that was a, you know, a, a you know, brilliant part of their strategy, uh, which, of course, I think as Dr. Daddy laid out, hid the very, I think, conservative nature of his presidency. So what we ended up getting were um, not only, um, I mean, remember the speeches he gave when he first went to West Africa and he gave that famous speech saying that uh, inequality throughout the continent of Africa was not the result of European imperialism, but the result of African leadership corruption. And then the very, like two months later, the British Broadcasting Company, the BBC, the very, you know, not radical BBC came out with a study that showed and it, it, quite the opposite. That in fact, over the last, I think the 30 years running up to, to Obama's election, there was, there was a, 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 I can't remember the numbers, but a theft of trillions of dollars that were not because of African corruption. In fact, they said only like, I think two to 3% could be attributed to corruption, but because of, of colonial trade deals and, and relationships that had been, uh, uh, you know, rebranded and amended into, into the, into the you know, uh, modern form. Uh, then he went to Egypt, of course, and, and, and he gave a speech to, to, to the Islamic world saying, don't be violent, and said violence never played a part in, in, in revolution, totally ignoring the American history, <laughs> the history of this country, where violence was essential to an overthrow <laughs> of British rule and the maintenance of it, and then how many wars were fought subsequent to that. Um, so, so, but, 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 but then more specific to Black America, he came back here, and everything that was 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 uh, tailored to uh, condemning the way Black fathers behaved or Black, uh, uh, you know, people behaved individually, and was never about a, a structural inequality. Uh, uh, and then there's many more. I mean, he, you know, uh, he, 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 his response to Ferguson was to, to fund the police with twenty million dollars for training. Uh, his, his the most he said about police violence was uh, that he, maybe his son would be Trayvon Martin, uh, but that wasn't backed up with any aggressive policy effort. Uh, certainly, his response to to the African continent was, as I said, something to you know misrepresent the inequality there. But then he, of course, helped the United States uh, with Africom or Africa Command take over the military, uh, all the militaries of the African continent and put it to the, the service of, of, of empire. He increased drone strikes, surveillance uh, uh, over even American citizens. And by the way, he, he uh, took away almost all the whistleblower protections from all these uh, American citizens who were trying to let people know what the state was doing in, in, in terms of surveilling us. I mean, there's a lot more. I mean, there's, there's plenty we could go on with. But the, the, the point being, and I think Dr. Terry's work shows us just as well, the economic condition after eight years of, 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 of Obama uh, uh, and the overall material condition of black people, period, did not improve at all. We saw, in fact, we had to see the rise of a Black Lives Matter movement. We had to see, you know, um, uh, uh, more protests in the street, more, more violent. In the city where I work, in Baltimore, Maryland, we saw one of the, the largest uprisings. And that's something we should talk about too, by the way, if we ever had time or maybe have a whole other session, because what people think happened in Baltimore around Freddie Gray uh, and the uprising there is an entirely falsely con constructed narrative that had nothing to do with Freddie Gray and everything to do with, with uh, uh, mobilizing police and, and, and federal Homeland Security fusion centers uh, and tests and all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, there's all kinds of shady stuff that went on in Baltimore that, that most people are not really aware of. Uh, but my point being, just to, just to stop here and, and, and I think buttress what Dr. Darity was saying, uh, if people look beyond the image and the propaganda uh, and, and the myth-making around Barack Obama, I think they would just see uh, without really much effort that their lives didn't change much. And then if they look at the data, they'll see that it, it didn't change at all. In fact, in, in many cases, it got worse. And then I'll stop here by saying that, that one of the most fascinating aspects of all that to me was that 
uh, right after his election, Barack Obama's campaign was given by the marketing community in the United States a uh, brand of the year. In other words, it was noted that he, he was marketed to us as a product uh, outdoing the, the top competitors of Nike and Apple that year. Uh, and that was the, the primary driving force behind uh, uh, his election. It had nothing to do with policy. It had nothing to do with what he was going to do. And in fact, uh, as we've saw, seen since, um, uh, nothing uh, of any real value occurred uh, as a result of his presidency. I can only say amen to all of that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask one last question. Uh, please let it be five minutes apiece so we can have some time for Q&A. We've got a, a lot of participants, many more than I anticipated, and I'm grateful for it. Um, this last question is going to speak to the fact that the United Nations has recommended that reparations be paid uh, to black Americans in the United States because of all disparities being attributed essentially to slavery and its long legacy. Um, Dr. Ball, you've been highlighted a while back, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, the uh, Nazi party, um, the Holocaust was actually perpetuated by the idea ideologies of Jim Crow. Um, but I guess essentially what I'm trying to say is, I wanted to add that little that little tidbit in because I think it's, it's important. Um, I want to start with you, Dr. Darity, if it's okay. Uh, how do we how do we achieve reparations or some form of reparations uh, that'll be corrective for black citizens and will it benefit all citizens of the United States? Do you believe that's that's my question? Well, uh, so so first of all, let, let me go to the last point. Uh, reparations per se is is not necessarily something that will benefit all citizens of the United States in a material way. It will benefit the United States in terms of achieving a, a moral status that the nation always has claimed but has never practiced. So uh, so from that perspective, I think there's there's a general benefit. But but reparations is a program that is specific to improving the status of a particular community in the United States. So it's not intended to become a an economic benefit for everyone unless you believe that improving the status of that community could have uh, external effects that benefited everyone. And I, I'm not sure about that in any, any clear and unambiguous way. You could design the program to make sure that you didn't harm anyone else who were not recipients of reparations. Uh, and that's, that's, that's a complicated issue, but I think there are some strategies that could be used to, to, to make sure that that was the case. Um, how do we get there? Uh, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I've never been sure. But I'm actually very, very startled by the current political moment where we do have candidates, uh, for the most part, who actually will invoke the term and say that they're in favor of what really constitutes the first important step in this process, which is the formation of a commission, either a congressional commission or a presidential commission, that would be responsible for setting the record straight on the history of American injustices and ongoing injustices that are directed against black Americans, and also uh, designing a program of restitution that could be translated into legislation. So uh, I think it's a critical first step, and we've got a significant number of candidates who said that they're willing to uh, endorse the formation of such a such a commission. Uh, I think that that's that's a key start because we've never had that happen before. Also, when uh, reparations were provided to Japanese Americans for their unjust incarceration during World War II, the prelude to that was the formation of a commission that had the assignment of setting the record straight about what occurred during World War II in terms of the uh, the, the federal government's decision to undertake the incarceration program and also to design remedies for the uh, for the victimized community. Thank you, Dr. Darity. Um, I propose the same question to you, Dr. Ball. Do you need me to repeat or is there any clarification? Yeah, please, please I do. I just want to make sure I, I, I stay to the five minutes and get it right, what you want. All right. 
Essentially, um, how do we achieve reparations in the United States? And if we did achieve reparations, do you think it'll be beneficial for all participants in this democracy, um, in quotations, known as the United States? Or do you think it'll solely benefit those who are receiving the compensation? So again, uh, man, so again, I want to be clear. Black people absolutely deserve reparations. And I think more, if not as, as least as much, if not more than anybody in human history. The problem that I have is that absent a, a, a revolution in, in, in political power, uh, absent uh, uh, some sort of political and social movement writ large that assumes political power, the forms reparations would take would ultimately be more damaging than beneficial. That's my initial concern. I'm not, you know, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, so whether it's the, the argument that some make, and not all make it, and, and I think very few of the serious reparations uh, are, are the, you know, um, uh, movement people uh, have this at the top of their list, but whether it's an individual check or whether it's something more institutional, uh, if the relationships don't change, I'm not entirely sure that, that, that even any amount would, would uh, overturn the problems that we have. That said, um, um, and this is why, at least in, in, in part of my argument, and this is why, you know, even among, you know, my best friends, I, I admittedly am not, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in the margins. Like, that, that I say that tactically, that there should be a, a move to make reparations a national issue that addresses, you know, all forms of inequality to make, it, you know, any form of poverty or homelessness or joblessness or, or absence of medical needs or health care uh, a moot issue for anyone. And the only reason I say that is because, again, I cannot see uh, 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 um, any group of people, white in particular, but any group, uh, voting in the numbers large enough to, uh, to redistribute the resources necessary specifically to black people in this country, in part because of the point I think you were making at the beginning, the connection that I like to make in the be between the two in the beginning. One, that you, you, you led up in uh, initiating the question to, to the Nazi Holocaust and Jews in Germany. One, I think it's important to remember that Nazi propaganda in the run-up to the ovens and the death camps was overt, graphic, and, and more than a decade long in preparing Germans for what would eventually happen. And people, Jews included, were in denial about what was even being said explicitly about them on posters and bus stops and news reels, et cetera, for quite a while. My equivalent in black America is, is that it's in this country, it's a more sophisticated form of propaganda where we see films like, you know, my argument is that while we're being driven off to the death chambers and trains, they'll be giving us Tyler Perry movies and Oprah specials. Um, my point being there that black celebrity and, and projection in this country is almost as damaging and in prep, and, 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 in preparing the country for the, all that black people suffer already, and that I think is, it, in, and for uh, uh, worse suffering to come. Um, and then finally, if we look at that same example, if you look at the, the work from Norrin Finkelstein, uh, the Holocaust industry, here is a Jew who lost both his parents, or whose parents, I'm sorry, both lost all of their families in the death camps. Um, whose argument fundamentally is that a Jewish elite, because of the, the, the absence of a political revolution in advance, a Jewish elite fought for, uh, siphoned off, and basically benefited solely for themselves what little reparations were given to Jews uh, for their suffering. And my point being is that I just w I'm just only concerned that if absent of an organized radical movement uh, for reparations for black people, that something similar could happen here, even if, if, even if it, it uh, were, were reparations to somehow be granted in some form. And then very lastly, I think one of the reasons why this, this discussion uh, in its more modern form, my argument is, is being made more conservative uh, uh, is because specifically those in power understand what many of us are late to catch up to. Reparations, a full a reparative effort would mean that the entire Western world would have to, uh, um, if not in, as we understand it, collapse, but redistribute itself to a point uh, uh, where where it would be unrecognizable to us uh, in the world as, in terms of its organization and power. So it's specific to the United States, this country would become unrecognizable to us were it to actually 
engage in the reparative efforts that are required uh, for black people specifically in this country. And that's why I think those in power, if anything, are looking to, to, to um, uh, at best rebrand it in, along conservative lines uh, to limit that potential revolutionary uh, uh, power within the reparation struggle. Could I, could I comment you. further? Oh, sure. Sure, follow up. Sure. I, yeah, no, I mean, I mean uh, Dr. Bowles raised some really, really critical issues. Uh, I think I may have a tendency to be excessively optimistic, but, uh, but I think there is a way through the question of having a reparations program that benefits black Americans exclusively and getting wider support from uh, segments of the population that won't benefit directly from the reparations program. And I think this involves the type of structural transformation that really is needed that, uh, that Dr. Ball is talking about. I guess where I'm more optimistic is I think there is a possibility or a, a prospect for actually having the kind of legislation put in place to bring about these structural transformations. And so I've been an advocate for a while of a set of policies that we now put under the rubric of an economic bill of rights for all Americans. And the premise here is that there should be certain kinds of guarantees for economic well-being that's made for every single American in the United States. And I think if we were to adopt the components of the economic bill of rights, at approximately the same time that we adopted a reparations program that is specific for black Americans, it might be possible to build the kind of political coalition that would support both types of initiatives. And, and an economic bill of rights, from my perspective, would include things like a federal job guarantee. It would include the development of postal banking and public banking services for all Americans. It would include the provision of a trust account for all newborn infants uh, and, and, and so forth. So that we actually set a, uh, a, a floor for comfort and participation in American life for every single American citizen. But there still would be the issue of compensation for black Americans for the history of injustice that we've experienced in the United States. And so there would be a need for a separate reparations program, but I think you might have a better opportunity to get it enacted if you also adopted an economic bill of rights for all Americans. Thank you. Before we close out, I just wanted to bring up two points that you both made. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. King was going to have the poor people's movement before he was assassinated, uh, where he wanted to unite all workers throughout the United States and shutting down the economic system to demand better uh, redistribution of wealth. If I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm right or wrong. And secondly, right now is the times of the playoffs. This speaks to celebrity, which Dr. Ball brought up. And Antonio Moore, I know he's a protege of, of yours in a sense, Dr. Um, Darity. He talks about the, the, the celebrity uh, kind of propaganda that's being put forward. And I'm thinking as the playoffs are going, I think of Detroit, they're in the playoffs, Los Angeles, New Orleans isn't in the playoffs, but they were close, Houston, um, Chicago, Philadelphia. You know, as a black person, you know if you travel to those areas, they got rough areas and they're economically deprived, but we see athletes that are championing the same states and, and, and counties and districts that are, that are impoverished. So I think that celebrity has done a massive job as far as propaganda and falsifying wealth uh, and showing us, broadcasting us with a multi-billion dollar corporation known as the NBA, the worldwide reach. So that said, thank you for presenting and bringing such informative discussion. I'm going to open up the floor to Q&A. Um, also, I want to open up Q&A to uh, the participants online. So I'll probably unmute you one at a time, starting with uh, Tamara Jenkins. But I wanted to start here in the um, in the auditorium to see if anybody wants to come forward and ask questions. Come on up and introduce yourself and ask questions. Um, this question is for Dr. Darity uh, on the uh, application of stratification economics on immigration. Uh, you stated um, that. The master narrative about immigration in the United States as one that the image 
of a nation of unbounded opportunity and freedom where newcomers uh, were destined to enter their newly adopted country at the bottom of the urban social ladder. Um, you also said that uh, aside from this master narrative, what is ignored are the experiences of African Americans brought to this country uh, by forced through slavery. Can you just explain, um, yeah, can you just explain more about the uh, stratification of economics dealing with immigration? Uh, I'll try. Uh, I think the, the points of the passages that you read are associated with uh, my effort to try, and it's not exclusively my effort, but, but I'll claim it, uh, my effort to try to distinguish the, uh, the historical position or the historical origin of the Black American presence in the United States, and for that matter, the Native American presence in the United States from the rhetoric that describes the United States as a nation of immigrants. So I, I think the nation of immigrants metaphor uh, really uh, omits or, or denies the experiences of the communities in the United States that were created by either by forced migration or were indigenous peoples to to uh, to this region of the world. And so uh, the point that was being made there is that if we want to understand the present day circumstances of a variety of communities, we cannot blend them all into the mixer of the nation of immigrant story and, and have an honest analysis. But I think that the more interesting subject that's introduced in, in, in the stratification economic section on um, on immigration uh, is this notion of imported stratification, where uh, groups that migrate from other parts of the world to a host country will frequently replicate the patterns of intergroup disparity that exist in their countries of origin. They'll just remake them here. And, and one of the most marked examples is uh, the East Indian communities' recreation of caste division when they come into the United Kingdom or come into the United States. Uh, I think that that's probably what, what's most interesting from my perspective about the discussion in that in that section of the uh, uh, of, of the stratification economics article. May I, well, may I say, say something that? about that? Yeah. Hello. Uh, just oh, very quick. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Just very quickly, I mean, and this is where, this is two quick points. One, uh, your, your, your reference to Dr. King is important because one, uh, when he talked about a, a check going uh, 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 un, unpaid uh, in this country, he was speaking philosophically, not literally. And he was talking about a radical revolutionary assumption of political power, meaning that, that there needed to be a change in who was in power and how uh, decisions were being made and the way the wealth that we were all contributing to was being redistributed. Um, and after his speech in 1963, he was targeted by the state specifically as uh, 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 by one of the founders of the counterintelligence program uh, as, as, a, as the number one threat, as he was called, to the Negro in delivering uh, uh, them or us to socialism or communism. Uh, and then 90 days before he was assassinated, the Washington Post had essentially targeted him as a, a threat to national security because they feared that his Poor People's March was going to be taken over by people like uh, Kwame Ture or Stokely Carmichael and the so-called Leninists. Uh, and then 90 days later, he was assassinated. So uh, there's, there, there, there is a, a radical um, uh, response to the inequality and, and a call for redistribution that, that is, is, is essential here that is tied to... Uh, the political imprisonment, assassination, and destruction of our of our movements by the state through again the counterintelligence program that should not go un, unaddressed at all. Secondly, very quickly, um, and this is where there there has been some disagreement among uh, 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 some of us in this in this in this discussion, uh, including some who have been I think described as as the the, the proteges of Dr. Darity, uh, where there is an initial legitimate an accurate assessment of a problem. In this case, there, that is that 
uh, uh, this, this mythology of a nation of immigrants, as Dr. Darity points out, is wholly ridiculous, uh, spe specifically when, we're, when we have to address and assess the conditions of black people in this country. This is not an immigration issue. Uh, secondly, uh, somewhat similar to what Dr. Darity was raising, there's a class issue that when so-called legal immigrants come here, studies have shown for a long time that they come here from a class position that already places them above the, the class position of the average so-called black American meaning that they're already coming here not looking to be in class solidarity or in struggle with, with the people here. Now, my difference and disagreement with some of those protégés is, is in the reaction or response, the more conservative response to say that black people should disassociate themselves from the struggles of other people and get soul focused uh, uh, and, and say that those people are, are taking advantage of our, of our struggles and so on and so forth. My response would be we need to understand that the state is itself trying to play us against those very communities whose oppression and inequality that they're leaving in the first place is largely due to the foreign policy of the United States. And as, a, as an, an analysis and a political response, we should see ourselves, as Dr. King did, in line and in league with those co uh, similarly colonized uh, populations and similarly oppressed populations to develop an international struggle that would put pressure on the state to give black people and others what it is that we deserve. So I just, I just wanted to quickly make uh, uh, as best I could those two points. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Before you go on, I want to give Mr. Hector an opportunity to follow up with his follow-up question. Yeah. Well, it's kind of what Dr. Ball was saying, uh, Dr. Darity, that um, in a sense, um, my father fleed the war in El Salvador in the 80s due to U.S. imperialism. So wouldn't you say that that is similar to being forced uh, to leave their home country to come to this country. And like Dr. Ball was saying, uh, you know, having similar experiences uh, as black Americans. So uh, let me say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure which of the protégés one is talking about or people who ostensibly are my protégés, but that, that's okay. Uh, you know, I don't. I don't normally think of myself as having proteges, but that's it. Um, but but I, I I do want to say this. My personal view is that it is imperative that we have uh, solidarity across Black people across the diaspora. But I also think that we have to recognize that there is differentiation across those communities. And so, what I would say to folks who have been victims of American imperialism uh, who have had to leave their countries because of, uh, of, of dangerous or brutal conditions there, I, I would still pose the question of, so why do you migrate to the imperial center instead of going somewhere else? But but I would but I'm sorry but that's see but that's a feature of all colonized experiences. Uh, the late great Ron Walters in his book on Pan Africanism highlights this in detail. All colonized people end up going to the colonial metropoles. That's why we see Senegalese in France and now Al Algerians in France, uh, and why we see Jamaicans uh, in, in in large numbers in England and so on and so forth. It's, it's because it's part of the mythology. It's the same reason, by the way, why black people in the South migrated north. It's the, it, it's the internal colonial model, which I'm, I've, I've used in my work to a great extent, that, that applies here as well. It's the same basic logic. So, so where I slightly disagree with, with, with the brother's quite point, I, I don't, as much as I'm a radical Pan-African as an internationalist, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to say that the Salvadoran struggle in El Salvador is, is the same as the enslaved African experience in the United States. I wouldn't want to put them on par. I would say that they're part of a similar struggle. I would say that they're allied and should be allied. But when we're looking at the specifics of what happened in the United States, I wouldn't want to say that they're in par, on par or the same. But what I would want to say is that to address the concerns of all, we would have to first address the, the role in all of this played by the, the most dominant force, which is the United States as a state. So, so rather than, and this is what I don't want to do, I try, I'd rather than get into what others have said is the oppression Olympics and try to say who is worse off than other, it would be to say, if we can note that the enslavement of Africans in this country, and if the 
if the imperialism, uh, 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 if the if uh, much of the struggles in El Salvador and Latin America, which the United States Monroe called his backyard, uh, um, it can be attributed to the foreign policy and imperialism of the United States, then that is what has to be addressed first uh, 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 before we can appropriately deal with any of these people's problems. And then I don't want it to become an issue where Black people are arguing against El Salvadorans who come here as a, as a result of struggle, saying that they're the reason why we're not getting getting our support. So, so Dr. Darity, for me, uh, uh, you know, Brother Montgomery said that that Antonio Moore was one of your protégés. Uh, that's who I was speaking of, and Yvette Carnell being another, who have made this very aggressive and hostile conservative attack on non-Black American immigrants who have said... Uh, and they, you know, wh whether you agree with them or not, they do use your work to support their claims that we need to be aggressively in, in a, a political, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, opposition to all of these other communities and, that, and blaming them as much as anybody else for the problems that we face. And I think that that's just unsound and, and, and un, you know, unsupported by fact, history or data. So... Um so I don't believe they used my data or information to address their positions on immigration. And I would say that I do not share the view that, uh, that, that, that black America or I personally should be intrinsically anti-immigrant. Uh, I haven't done that much research on, on immigration per se. So I think the work that they use is typically the work that I've done on questions of racial wealth inequality, the sources of racial wealth inequality and what types of remedies have been appropriate. And that's how I first came into contact with Antonio Moore. And I, I really admire his efforts to make sure that the kinds of stories that you described that are utilized at the grassroots level about the great economic potential that's untapped in black America, that his attempts to, to confront those kinds of stories has been extremely useful. Um, so on, on the immigration question, uh, I think that there is a serious issue though that needs to be addressed, which is the, uh, the mutual attitude of, of both the, uh, the native black American community and the black American community of more recent immigration. Uh, because the black American community of more recent immigration frequently is drawn from uh, what the term we use is that they're hyper selective. They're, they're typically drawn not only from a class position that exceeds the average black American, but they are drawn from a class position that exceeds the average white American. And so they're a hyper-selected community, and at certain points in time, they look at black Americans with a large degree of disdain, similar to the fact that black Americans have a significant amount of ignorance about the countries of Africa. So I think that there is a mutual issue that has to be addressed before we could be successfully cooperative. Anybody have any other follow-up questions? Come on down and ask the question. Introduce yourself. We do have another question in the room, so please bear with us. Hi, my name is Denise. I'm an adjunct professor here. I, my question is to Dr. Ball. Uh, as you described what you thought was a better position on reparations, it sounds somewhat like Andrew Yang, the presidential candidate on universal uh, basic income. So I was wondering if you support that and what you thought, if he was on the right track or the wrong track with his proposal. Um, actually, I'm not, which candidate was this? I'm not even familiar with. He, he's Andrew Yang. Andrew uh, Yang, he's running for uh, president, I believe on the Democratic ticket, uh, promoting a universal basic income and that all um, Americans, I believe, at the age of 18 would receive some basic income to create some sort of parity. Yeah, I mean, you know, Dr. King advocated that, as did Richard Nixon, by the way, uh, um, uh, basically, you know, uh, arguing that a guaranteed income of some sorts would, would alleviate, you know, the hostilities of, you know, of capitalism and, and reduce crime, et cetera. But this is sort of the point I was getting at earlier. I mean, it sounds good. Obviously, it sounds good. And I, I don't, I, you know, it sounds better than what we're, we're getting. My problem is, A, uh, I fundamentally don't believe the Democratic Party is sincere about any of this. Uh, so I think that, that 
for the most part, and I think this was a, this was seen mostly with Obama. The Democratic Party is, um, uh, whereas others have pointed out, where, where radical politics go to die. But 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 it's I think it, you know, I think I think that it, I think what their goal is is to sort of siphon off a lot of the righteous anger in the community and in the country. And to say, to give them a safe place to go with the vote that will not in, in, in the end um, lead us anywhere. So, for instance, one of the problems that I'm having right now is that a lot of attention is going to some strong sisters in the Democratic Party. And with all due respect, I, they deserve it, uh, Ilhan Omar and, and, and the like. But what people are losing sight of is that in this last Democratic, in this last electoral cycle, the Democratic Party brought in more intelligence agents, former intelligence agency and military personnel into their candidates than ever before. So, so there are a few radicals that got in, but the party overall is itself uh, gone in a more conservative direction, and and its leadership already is making clear it's not interested in having its party. Turn over, uh, be turned over to some, some some something more akin to radicalism. So there will be all kinds of overtures to reparations and guarantees and all of these other things. But when it comes down to it, all of these entities are still funded by Wall Street, uh, the military industrial complex, and and the like, and and therefore cannot, uh, by definition, lead uh, uh, the kind of lead to the kind of political change that, that we would want. So I think this is where we, again we have to just be very careful uh, in assessing the the, the the attempt, look, I mean, the same thing with Black Lives Matter. I mean, there were there was new conversation in the Democratic Party about race, at least seemingly. But in terms of actual policy or movement or anything, nothing is nothing uh, uh, is, is, is anything, uh, you know, uh, likely going to happen. So I just wouldn't want any of us to lose sight of that, um, whether it's about reparations or guarantees of any kind. Uh, and then very lastly, I think if you look at the data, which, which I have, by the way, um, the Democratic Party essentially took its own primary from Bernie Sanders to assure that Hillary Clinton would get their nomination because, as, as someone else has pointed out, they would rather uh, lose with Hillary than win with Bernie because Bernie was being seen as, as too radical. And I think that is, is a great summary of where we're going to be headed in the next election cycle uh, with reparations or guaranteed incomes as being, as being part of the conversation. Yeah. So uh, could I comment on the guaranteed income? Yes, uh, please do. Because I'm, I'm actually an advocate of a federal job guarantee. I don't view the two as mutually exclusive, but one of the great objectives of a federal job guarantee, which is the idea of ensuring that every American adult has access to a publicly sector supported job at non-poverty wages with benefits that are equivalent to the package that's available to all public civil servants at the federal level, that one of the effects of that would be to create a floor on the level of compensation that the private sector would have to provide for each American employee, because people would then have an alternative where they could say, shove this job to the private sector if it's a job that's dangerous, poorly paid, uh, et cetera. So it, it, it's a... Uh, it's a non-revolutionary transformative change. Uh, now, what's, what's the case with the universal basic income? Well, most of the versions of the universal basic income that I have seen would essentially subsidize bad jobs because it would make it possible for people to have supplementary income and enable the private sector to continue to offer low paid or bad jobs. Uh, and that's something that's, that, that would be overcome by a federal job guarantee. So I'm, I would prefer a world with a federal job guarantee and no universal basic income to a world with a universal basic income and no federal job guarantee. Can I just quickly say that, that what Dr. Darity said there is really important and I think exactly correct and why I, I somewhat jokingly made the point at the beginning that both Nixon and Dr. King supported a, a, a guaranteed income. Uh, one for very conservative <laughs> yeah. reasons and one for very revolutionary reasons. But I think what Dr. Darity says there about the actual impact and purpose of it, of it is exactly right. And again, why we should be suspicious, especially when Democratic Party uh, politicians are the ones claiming it. Okay. Thank you. Um, just clarification. Correct me again if I'm wrong. Wasn't that a part of uh, some of the demands of the Black Panther Party that federal jobs be guaranteed to all citizens within uh, Black community, if I'm not mistaken? Was that a part of their? Yeah, and their... I think it's 
I, I think it's also part of the Black Lives Matters uh, agenda for the for the uh, for the future. Thank you. And last question I want to propose, um, and this is to both of you. It's open floor question. I would love for you both to answer it. Dr. Ball has already answered it partially. Um, Donald Trump is he the cause or the solution? Uh, I mean, not the cause, the cause or symptom rather of the United States. Uh, political crises. I mean, did he cause it, or is he merely what's been regurgitated? And I don't mean any offense to anybody who's not a Trump fan. Please don't don't take that as, <laughs> as an insult, because you know he didn't even. I, I I mean, a lot of people didn't project him to win. So is he the cause, or is he a symptom of something prolifically wrong with our political structure? And this is for both of you who close this out, please. <laughs> Would you? Who, who, um, you want somebody I'll, to go I'll first? Dr. Darity first. Okay. Dr. Darity first. Yeah, no, I, I, I just, I, I would say both. Uh, <laughs> you know, because because his 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 election is a consequence of uh, of certain uh, deeply held beliefs among a core segment of the population that has disproportionate influence on our presidential outcomes. Uh, so, so that that's the sense in which he's a symptom, but I would also say he's a cause because of the ways in which he maneuvers, the type of rhetoric he uses, uh, his overt use of the the symbol the symbols of white supremacy. So uh, I think in in some sense he's he 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 makes the fire burn even even higher. So I would say both both cause uh, both cause. Both symptom and 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 cause. Thank you, sir. And Dr. Dar or Dr. Ball, would you be so kind as to close us out on your thoughts concerning? Sure. I largely agree. Uh, I largely agree, and I and I wrote about what I'm about to say. Uh, shameless plug in, in a book called Not Our President uh, that came out on Third World Press about a year or so ago. A collective of us wrote uh, in an anthology. I should say I contributed chapter, but. Uh, and I say that to say because my argument is a little bit, I think. Um, um, unconventional uh, in that my, my critique of Trump starts largely with the, the so-called liberal left of the United States. That again, if we go back and look at what happened with the 2016 election, we saw the Democratic Party that promoted Trump. We know from the WikiLeaks uh, um, releases that it was Hillary's campaign that said specifically they want to promote Trump as the quote Pied Piper candidate that would make a, a Democratic Party victory more easy. That came back and obviously uh, uh, backfired. Uh, we know that, at least I'm convinced through the data and this, the research, that the Democratic Party gave away its own primary to Hillary, a more conservative, less, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, less um, supportable candidate, someone highly unliked by, uh, you know, certainly black people, but by many others. Um, uh, because you know they didn't want to win with somebody they thought would be more radical, despite polls showing. Even I saw one the other day from Fox News that said <laughs> Sanders would still beat Trump. Um, but but it's also a more liberal uh, uh, apparatus, broadly speaking, that I think is to blame here. Not only was it eight years of Obama, as we've already highlighted, that did nothing for people, that led led many to go from voting for him to Trump and, and, and ignoring the party altogether. But it was the, the more broadly speaking liberal media apparatus that for decades have been putting Trump in our face. And as a media studies scholar, someone who focuses on this, I mean, we cannot underestimate how uh, um, the, the, you know, Theodore Adorno wrote, you know, uh, almost a hundred years ago now that we, we're, 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 we often confuse like for recognition. And for 30 years, Trump had been referenced in every form of popular cultural thing. I mean, there was even a, 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 someone who even put out a, a thing, an analysis showing that going back to the 80s, how many times he's been referenced in hip hop lyrics. Um, so we've constantly had this, uh, this and of course, the, the TV show more recently, Trump always in our face from a liberal media apparatus that wanted to make fun of him and use him to make money and so on and so forth, uh, uh, that all backfired and led us to this moment. And I think that this is why, again, my critique always starts with those who claim to be liberal or claim to be progressive, um, who I think need to be made more so, uh, so that our analysis would be driven more to the left and that we can develop the kind of movements and, and, uh, that we would need to put the pressure on any candidate or the state itself to give us the things that, 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 that we're all on here having a conversation about. 
Um, so again, I think, you know, I think it was perfectly correct that Buster Rhymes called Donald Trump Agent Orange because he's a product of the military industrial complex, <laughs> just as the original, and, and designed you know, to create havoc, uh, long lasting <laughs> havoc in our communities. And I think he's done just that. Well, I want to thank everyone for their time and their participation. Um, definitely want to give a shout out to Mr. Hector Sor Sorzano. I hope I pronounced your name correctly for being a part of uh, helping me to put this together. Of course, Dr. Jared Ball and Dr. Darity, thank you for taking your time to enlighten us and give us some great um, perspective on reparations, our current political struggles, and the changes that may potentially be necessary if we politically believe. I really do thank you for your time, and I hope to look forward to having another event similar to this. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Take care, thank everybody. You. Take care. I mix what I like, 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 what I like.